in this week's thrilling episode of Roleplay Geeks. We're thinking ahead to the future when we can game in person again. And that means we're talking tables. Big tables, tabletop toppers, futuristic tables. So buckle in for a riveting talk on nerd furniture as we wait for Jimmy to pull himself together and pray for a better tomorrow. Welcome to Roleplay Geeks. I'm your host, Frank. I'm your token hippie, John. I'm, S- I'm Jim. I'm Jim. Jesus, say it again. Say it again. I'm Jim. And I'm Steve. <laughs> <laughs> Today we're going to talk about making a role-playing table. Now, on the surface, this would seem something that would be simple. You just get a table, right? You get something with four legs, maybe one pedestal in the middle. You sit down, grab some pen, grab some paper, grab some dice, and have at it. Oh, table. Oh, I thought you meant like Excel. Oh, man, I'm so... Okay, never mind. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, we will <laughs> not be excelling with that Ooh. today. Don't. Uh, don't. Mm. Just don't. <laughs> anyway, with the sort of... I mean, I'm sure this happened before when we were kids, but it never occurred to me uh, when we were younger to make a special device that had all features and functions specifically for role-playing. I think we just used in both my house and John's house. I don't remember at Steve's house, but we tend to use a card table. I mean, a folding card table. Yeah, up in my room, we used my card table. And then we had my cheap, crappy dice that came with the box set. And it was one manual and our character sheets and some pencils. And that's literally all we had. So we didn't really need much more, you know. Right. Right. So there's a lot of, you know, you just kind of made do with what you had. But uh, I think since the Internet has become a thing and people started talking about this hobby a lot more, you hear a lot of people who have done some rather extraordinary things to make a proper piece of furniture for doing role playing. And uh, I think this intrigues me in particular. And I think uh, it's fair to say intrigues all of us at some level. Well, yeah, I I was really blown away by some of the things that I've seen online. I I really wish I would have kept track of the, you know, some of the ones I've seen that people have done, but there's some amazing ones. And then some of them I really, um, maybe works for, you know, other people, but for me, it seemed a little over the top. And they've got, you know, a, a lot of them I've seen have a kind of a, um, an over under shelf kind of deal where you've got a little pocket for your, um, dice and you can put your manuals or books in and your character sheet and then it has a cup holder and a dice roll cup and et cetera, et cetera. And I mean, I like some of that, but some of it gets a little bit on the unwieldy side, I believe. But otherwise, I mean, I mean, a lot of them I could see it'd be really useful to have, I guess. So, but I could see it not working like in your house, for example, when we come and play at your house, Frank. That might be kind of unwieldy to have in your living room slash dining room or wherever. Because it really wouldn't work too well as a, I don't think Barb would think it's like an awesome piece of furniture. You know what I mean? There's a handful of companies now that produce these things, right? So they make them and you can buy them and they get, they can get very expensive. And some of them are fairly ornate intricate pieces of furniture. I think the most complicated one I'd seen would basically, the only way I can describe it is imagine a roll top desk without the roll top part. And then there's like four stations or six stations of like the roll top part where everybody sits at and you got these drawers and little cubbies and all the things like that. And the tabletop sits at basically eye level. And you know, it, it's a very ordinate piece of furniture. I think you're right. I think it's one of those things that if you have a room dedicated just to role playing, it may make sense, but most people don't have the luxury of having just a specific game room. So they have to have a piece of furniture that can serve double duty as a coffee table or a dining room table or whatever it may be. So you have these functionalities, but you also need to have the ability to sort of transform back into a regular thing. And it's really interesting to see that some of this furniture you can purchase at very, I think, fairly expensive, you know, thousands of dollars to buy these uh, pieces of furniture. So I think it naturally lends itself to thinking about how you can make one yourself. And I think that we've all had some lot of thoughts about that. I, I agree. I, I don't know if you guys have really looked into this very much, but uh, Frank and I certainly have. And, and we've looked at the idea of putting a maybe like a 32 inch or larger television 
as the work surface and then you could run like a laptop or even maybe an iPad or something to for the GM to go to run maps and so you could display maps with the fog of war etc and then everything would kind of run off of that and then you could have a, a you know a dynamic maps and dynamic everything really but again that really kills the idea of um you know, a lot of significant others would not be happy to have a television in the middle of their dining room table. <laughs> so I've thought about this a lot, too. I, I've thought about it quite a lot. And Stephen and I actually went down and built or started building a table. I don't remember how far we got. We had everything. The only thing we didn't do is assemble it in its final form, but we had all the pieces. Where did that end up? Did I give that to you? No, it was in your garage and it got wet because uh, of the roof M or something. MDF. Yeah. 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 MDF does not like water. Yeah. So, so you should you should still have that glass insert and the pile pieces. Uh, they're probably in the uh, snake house. Oh. Then, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so we're just going to blow past that. Yeah, the, the, the project all of a sudden took a turn to, oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> so, so fine, fine. But, yeah, you know, there, there are three main places that I keep going back to that have made a go at this. And, you know, the one with the most ornate table is the table of Ultimate Gaming, and that's ultimategametable.com. Theirs are pretty ornate. Uh, it's not like the, uh, now, there was one that was just absolutely ridiculous that somebody made as a one-off that reminds me of what Frank was saying. And this thing had almost like a pool table system in it where you could roll little balls with notes and stuff in it to the DM from your seat and stuff like that. It was insane. But... This company makes a fairly ornate table with, with options. Like, you know, you can have, you know, stuff CNC routed, inlays, things like that. And it's a, it's a pretty good looking table. The one that seems to have gotten the most attention and, and probably business is BoardGameTables.com. And their table is kind of your typical rectangular, four legs at the corners table and they started doing the tabletop recessed with a border around it so you've got this lip of like maybe three inches all the way around and then the tabletop itself is sunken uh, it's kind of like a water table for kids museum or a playhouse or a park their tables are pretty cool uh, and they have covers for the sunken area, so you can, you know, stop playing your game, leave everything in place, cover it back up, and use it as a dining room table. So, you know, that's pretty cool. And and that kind of table, you're talking about the inset TV screen. If you had one in, in something like that, would be virtually invisible to anybody until, you know, you needed it. Table of Ultimate Gaming has a similar design. It has a slightly larger lip, and the table looks a little more rustic fantasy like it's got some buttressing under the lip but same basic concept you know seats about six people rectangular shape now the other place that i've looked and i went back last night just to see what they had going on right now is under the table gaming and this is what i thought of when you were talking about frank's house because frank has a living room with a very nice, large coffee table. And under the table gaming kind of specializes in table toppers. And so they make these that would go over, say, a small gaming table or a dining room table or a coffee table. Uh, they make specifically a board game coffee table that looks like it does a pretty good job of holding a game about the size of Catan. Uh, it's also a recess with panels that you can put over it. Now, the difference between what Jimmy and I were making was we settled on a 5x5 table 
that had a three foot by three foot glass flush insert in the middle. And that was to be lit from underneath. And you could use the glass with dry erase markers. You could put maps under it, or you could mount a television under it. The thing we thought of with the inset legs, one of the things I don't like about gaming at a dining room table are the legs at the corners. Because if you ever have more people, then you know it's always a pain in the ass to get at the corner or fit more than three people to a side. So very comfortably, a five foot by five foot square table will fit eight people easily, and you can actually squeeze an additional four at the corners if you had to. Our particular design, because there was a two foot lip that was split, it, so it was a it was a square, it was a foot lip all the way around the edges, right? So that was big enough for somebody to put down a full size source book, a fifth edition book room enough to have everything you needed on the tabletop and still have this interior space for gaming. And I will take a breather now. That was exciting. <laughs> so what were okay, we let's, talking let's, about? Wait, yeah. Where am I? Let's get back to let's get back to basics for a second. Okay. So uh one of the things we haven't really addressed uh, in setting this up is is that clearly there's a desire to make these tables that are capable of doing more than what a normal table can do. But I don't think we've really identified why. What what is missing from a table? Cuz I think if you're if you're trying to figure out in any product design, if you're trying to figure out, well, it's going to do this and it's going to do that and it's going to do the other thing, there has to be deficiencies you're trying to to overcome or capabilities you're trying to add uh to the current setup and and from from that perspective, what do you guys think a, a table, a gaming table specifically, needs to have? Inset legs, based on what I was just talking about. Right, so you could get like a pillar table, and it would be fine for your needs. Well, it pretty much make what you need. You could get a pillar table, but the problem with a pillar table is a lot of them. It's it's actually kind of a weak point. Uh, you can't put a lot of weight on the edges. Um, a lot of antique pillar tables that you get, uh, there, there's a weak spot where that pillar attaches to the table itself. So when you've got a bunch of, uh, let's say, husky nerds sitting around a table, putting their elbows on it, maybe somebody leaning up against it, you don't want to stress that kind of fulcrum point. And so the inset leg design <laughs> where you've got it spread out. Sorry, Jimmy. We, husky we have, nerd. I just well, like it. I, husky. I'm, I'm kind of husky, you know. I'm, I'm two nerds in one well, body. I just like the way it sounds. Husky nerds. <laughs> That's a band. It's a band name. Husky nerds. Okay, it's not a good band name, but it's a band name. But it is a band name. It it is one. It's just not a very good one. Um, okay, so the one thing that Steve has identified is the ability to have lots of people leaning on it and and not bang you in the knees. Okay, what else? So for me, I I, I take the approach. I, I I approach it like this. Um, I close my eyes and imagine my fourteen year old self with hair, and I think to myself, you know, with what we have today, what would I want? So this is the sort of like dream list of what I would want. I want a table that's a table, a regular table, when I'm not using it for gaming. Then when I am using it for gaming, it's got to have the following criteria. A place for me to keep my drinks cold to where I don't have to get up and go get them from the refrigerator. A place, a big vat for my potato chips where I reach in and magically I pull out the chip I want at that moment. Which is easy because I like all chips, so I'll be happy with anything that comes out of the chip, the magic chip drawer that it's the magic bag of holding for chips and then uh i want the tabletop to be a computer like roll 20 where you could put the roll 20 or finish grounds whatever stuff you're using up on there so you have the maps and they're scaled to the right size on a big enough surface to where you could move your little tokens around on the grid and it matches like real tokens or you could use the electronic tokens You'd have the tokens you'd either use electronic ones, but if you wanted to use real miniatures, you could, and they'd be sized right. 
And then you'd have the ability to have a screen up at the end of the table, maybe multiple screens, maybe one big screen, where you would see remote players. So you'd have like me, Steve, me, Stephen, John, and Frank playing there at Frank's and then or at Stevens. And then Steve-O would come in remotely and be up on the screen. So all of that. And then a place where I can roll dice without having them hit the floor because uh, I'm an aggressive roller sometimes. And a drawer where I can keep all of my stuff and just leave it there because I lose stuff all the time. And so if I just leave it in one place, that's probably a good thing. And I think that's probably about it. Oh, and whenever we're using the tabletop, um, you you want to be able to reach all the miniatures and stuff. So it has to magically be able to resize the board exactly to where I need it to be. So I don't have to go all the way around the board to move my miniatures around. You can, you can use one of those like graspy hand things with the <laughs> that old people use to get their Metamucil off the top shelf. So you can, you can do that. Actually, I was thinking more Tom Cruise Mission Impossible kind of thing where he just dangles from the ceiling so he can reach stuff. And we have Jimmy. I I see where you're going with it. I mean, a lot of that sounds pretty good. And then you can... Go ahead, John. I mean, I, I like the idea of the, the screen in the table. I mean, that makes it work pretty well if you want to, you know, incorporate virtual, uh, gaming guests. And of course, like a monitor at the end can kind of work. But I really, probably realistically would be the easiest thing to do would be just to get a laptop and stick it at one end where a person might be. And that way you can have your virtual guest on the laptop and just hope you've got a wide angle enough camera to capture everyone. But yeah, that, I think that that would be kind of neat. Uh, one thing I even looked at was using a projector uh, to project directly down onto the table surface. And then, of course, you're just displaying a map there on the surface. And then you could, you know, pretty easily, you don't have to worry about glass or, mar you know, marking up a surface or anything else. And then you could, you know, have your miniatures or whatever tokens down. So any number of those things might, you know, work pretty well. The only problem you have with a uh, projector is you either have to kind of permanently mount it to the ceiling or have a fixture that would be permanently mounted that you could then hang the projector on, then running all the cables, etc., or to either make a um, some sort of, not trellis, but some sort of, you know, mount that, that fixes to your table to hold the projector. So all that gets kind of crazy. So that's all the ways not to do it. Well, I mean, as I said, if, if you've got a permanent or semi-permanent place that you could do it, actually it'd work out really pretty nice. I think it'd actually work pretty fantastic for just regular role-playing gaming, you know, if, if you want to use maps, miniatures, etc. If you don't have a, a, a semi-permanent place you could do that, it kind of kills it, so... Okay, Steve, you only identified the one aspect, whereas Timmy had like 87. Did you use any other parts like to a virtual tabletop that you've thought about that weren't mentioned? Oh, oh, well, you're the only Steve in the room, you freak. Well, I, I, for a second there, for some reason, the name didn't hit me. And I, <laughs> it's like I blacked out for a minute. And I'm looking at you guys on the stream stroke. and I'm like, who are these people? I'm like, is he, is that to, but I just, wait, I think I used all my words already. I've done, I've done, I used all my words. My bag is empty. So, you know, the, the things we you, were... you have a word bag of holding. That's what I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> Great minds. You could just go all the way. You could go elbow, your arm, shoulder deep into this word bag of holding and come back with, it's a cornucopia Word bag of holding. Oh, nice. Nice. You unzip it and just... <laughs> so Words! There's nothing to worry about there. Words. Go ahead. Well, <laughs> well so, so with the one that we did, it was supposed to be sturdy enough for a herd of husky nerds. And so... <laughs> That was that was. There's your one. band name, herd of husky nerds. There's your <laughs> there band name. There we go. That's perfect. <laughs> you know, it was supposed to be durable for that. It was supposed to be able to seat as many people as possible, but still fit in 
you know, a, a good size dining room. And five by five is kind of the maximum for that. It, five by five is a big table, but it, it's serviceable. And you could use it for other things because I spend a lot of time playing with people who use dry erase markers, who use a glass piece on a table, who, you know, put dry erase boards on the walls, things like that. I really like the idea of having the glass insert so that you can do that directly on the table if you need. It also has to have a backlit tabletop, at least part of it. In the one that Jimmy and I made, because it was, you know, the idea was the proof of concept thing, there were no drawers, there were no cup holders, there were no inset areas for dice or anything like that. But I've still got the drawings for those plans that are 15, 16 years old. Yeah. Yeah, yeah because kind of when Kira came along is when I think my participation dropped off. Funny how kids sidetrack you, huh? I know, right? Because you had gotten over that initial hump. Yep. And and then I entered it. But but that table had enough room for the drawers. I like the idea of the drawers that, that Jimmy was mentioning where you can keep your stuff. You know, if you've got a set game group and people sit at a set location usually, you know, if you've got drawers for that, it's great. Because at Frank's house right now, he has a basket. And that basket has a hodgepodge of, like, papers and pencils and, you know, a dice tower and all this stuff. Some of it Jimmy, some of it mine. I don't know if John has anything. You know, having having the ability to have pieces on the table or built into the table that serve those functions is great. Now, another thing that the the two full-size table people are doing you know you get the option to have charging ports for phones plugs for your laptop oh yeah 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 that was something i meant to say too yeah 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 usb ports plug-in ports all that stuff so that you could use your tablet and move your token around that way you wouldn't have to reach across the table you could just move your tokens on roll 20 around from each of your individual devices that's a good idea yeah, so the interior wouldn't have to be touch sense. But that's that's so ridiculous to think about. We're all around a five by five foot table. It's ornate. It's lit in the middle. There's a screen and a map and all this glorious stuff. And there's accent lighting. And everyone's sitting there looking at their damn phones. Oh, my accent best. lighting. Yes, accent lighting. Yes. Yeah, that'd be good. LED stuff. Yeah. Yeah. That you could change the colors to. Yeah. So... Okay, there's a few other things that you left out. Um, I interrupted Steve, but I'm going to, <laughs> which is sound. Um, so the ability oh, to have yeah. sort of ambient sound coming out of this the system. If you start to think about this thing in a very real sense, is what we were essentially talking about is a device that has evolved from a flat surface to roll some dice and write some notes down to a multimedia experience, really. And there's a there's a couple parts of this. One is is that gaming is always an ongoing endeavor. It's not like you sit down and play, you know, with our parents or grandparents. You sit down and play, you know, Canasta every Thursday, and the game is over, and you don't have to worry about it anymore because the next game is independent. In, in role playing, it's an ongoing story, and and for the most part, you you know need to have some permanence, some ability to move from one time to another time. And, and, the, and part of this is that, you know, you've got this permanence or this idea of, of a storage ability, but you've also got this sort of multimedia experience. Uh, unfortunately, uh, or fortunately, depending on your point of view, if you did something like a television or even projector, obviously you can't do like a five by five table because the surface, uh, well, the proportions tend to be, you know, 16 by nine or something like that uh, to account for the TV or the screen. So a, a one by one uh, ratio wouldn't work so good, but... Uh, you get the same sort of effect, right? Uh, and on top of that, you would have some sort of computing built in. For me, to a large extent, I kind of think that it would be really cool to have three tiny monitors, or at least two tiny monitors. Now, when I say tiny, I mean like iPad mini size, all right? And so that, that you have your own little station there, and and that would have your touchscreen ability because you'd have your um, 
what you're seeing on the screen on the tabletop, but you'd also have your reference material there because I find more often than not, we're looking at digital reference material, not a source book. And then you would also have the ability to have a place for your dice and things like a dice tower. So I do find myself slightly intrigued by this general notion of this sort of two-tiered, you have a shelf where your stuff exists and then up above is the table surface. But I also feel like the tricky bit here is how do you do this in such a way that it doesn't impede the fun of role playing together? You know, how do you, how do you do all that stuff and not impede that feeling of sitting at a card table? I don't know, but I want to give it a go. Oh, and I just thought of something else. It'd be really cool if you had a button you push and a little TV would come up uh, vertically uh, for like the remote players. So, so it looks like they're setting there. Like a Star Trek kind of thing. Well, I think that would be the laptop thing. You know, the laptop is essentially what John talked about. You put that at the end, and that's what they look like. And the tricky bit here, of course, oh, is Oh, no, that let's go all better... out. Let's go all out. I mean, a full vertical-sized thing of torso up the head. I swear I've seen this in an 80s movie of, you know, like the all those, villains. Yeah, exactly. all those it's bad like sci-fis. James Bond like villain kind of thing going yeah. on. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Of Perfect. course, if, if you had that at the seating stations because of the necessary space involved, you would basically be gaming at a large box because there would be no under-the-table space. I swear to God, why do you have to bring physics into everything? <laughs> because of the English degree, really. It's, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, don't, don't get an English degree, kids. So... I, 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 not really. I, lo I love the fact that I have a degree. How about that? I love the fact that I have a degree. That everybody who works retail has. And, and that is why I spent so many years in IT. <laughs> so. All right. So uh, <laughs> we talked about the dream table, right? And they've actually, there's been some movement to make these things. Microsoft made a, um, uh, I forgot what it is, the smart table. This has been 10 years or so. Now. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and somebody had actually uh, made the software so that it was a touch table and it could actually read what was on the screen. So you could put a token down and it would, you know, like a, like a miniature and it would read what it was. Uh, it also had the ability, which I thought was really neat, is you could roll a die and it would, it since it knows what it's seeing what is showing upwards is the opposite of that on the die on a D20, for example, then it could see what you rolled and actually do a lot of the calculations for a lot of the things that are a pain in the neck. So, I mean, we all know that when you're doing combat, it's a real annoyance to have to do all the math, essentially, because really what you want to know is, did you hit, did you not? So you want, you want to roll the die and then you want to know if you, if you hit and then you want to roll more die and find out how much damage you did. And there's a lot of math behind that. And that's what computers do well. So it's really neat that it can just sort of do that. And I think that's the dream mm -hmm. when you get down to it. Well, what are you doing, John? I don't know if I was just looking at my dice. Well, oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's fondling my dice. You know, w one of the things about the smart table and the inset table and having anything built in to a table is the rapid pace of obsolescence for those technologies right now. I would not want a gaming table with a built-in screen, whether that would be in the middle or whether it would be in stations. I have found that having just using a television in the room or using a projector to handle anything that you need visually or the laptop a little more realistic and, and you're not you know making a piece of furniture an expensive piece of furniture that's in your house that has an electronic part that can break and you know if you can't fix that yourself you know you're kind of bone well you don't need a whole lot for it right yeah that's one thing you don't need a like a really expensive television yeah while the technology might move forward for several features, the features that you need, you really don't have to replace it very often. But um, in terms of having a expensive piece of furniture, I, I think that you're right. You'd have to have a way to swap it out easily. And one of the things I found when I was looking around is they had these shadow boxes that had TVs inside of them that they would use for maps. So you would just set that shadow box down on your regular table 
and be able to use that. And I, I didn't check to see what kind of uh, attachments they had, whether or not they had audio uh, attachments available, probably because, you know, they have them built into the TV, so they probably made those available. Well, I think one of the things you're going to have an issue with, though, if you use a TV as your map screen, as it were, um, really the best thing for that would to be to use a something about the height of a coffee table because you're going to have an issue of, of being, um, for one thing, the um, view angles of televisions have improved significantly if you get pretty expensive ones. But then there's the issue like you have, Jamie, where, you know, being able to reach anything is a bit more of a challenge at times. <laughs> but, but realistically, though, if you're talking about like, like what is that, ultimategamingtable.com, I mean, they have, you know, their tables are about four by six. They have some other, I think, three and a half by five and a half. But four by six is, I think, their kind of nominal table size. So someone sitting at the end is going to be three feet from the center. And I'm six feet tall, and my my arm length is probably about two and a half feet. So I can't, I could not, you know, comfortably stay seated and do much except move my character, you know, a a miniature or a token, a physical token, except on the periphery closest to me on that screen. But if you were, if you had a coffee table kind of thing, then of course you'd, you'd be able to lean down a little bit easier and be able to stretch a bit further to get what you needed to get. So, so hey, let me let me t- let me say something real quick. Frank. The cool thing is about the table that Jimmy and I made was the legs were removable, so. The object was you had three table huts. You could have bar table, normal table, and you could have coffee table. So we had, you know, kind of thought about that particular aspect of it. And because a lot of times coffee table height is just really great. We need one of those standing desks that have the electronics built in them that you push right. a button and it's got memories built in. That's what yes. we need. Yes. Yes. Mm. So mm-hmm. there's an aspect of, of all this tabletop stuff that we just haven't talked about, and I rarely hear people talk about it, which is you don't use a table in a vacuum. You don't j- – rarely do you just use a table, period. Because you can't and breathe typically- in a vacuum. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you typically have seating of some sort, right? And we don't spend a lot of time thinking about how we like to sit – when we play, maybe right? you, maybe so, your small ass doesn't, but my large ass absolutely thinks about seeing. Well, when I say we, I would say in this industry and as a culture, we don't tend to talk. I don't see a lot of virtual. Uh, I don't see a lot of um, role playing chair sites <laughs> being out there. I mean, comparatively speaking, we tend to focus on the table and not so much on the seats. So, and I think that's interesting because when you play on something that's like a dining room table side, that's four by six, it requires a different type of seating and it has different comfort and ergonomics and that sort of thing. And so what I was thinking is that, okay, when you're sitting at a dining room table, you typically don't do that for more than an hour, maybe for dinner. And then you get up and move around in a role playing session, which can often run several hours if you know, uh, many hours, a lengthy period of time. The notion that you would be sitting there for a long period of time is sort of anathema to the entire uh, concept behind a dining room table, which is where something like a coffee table is a lot more intriguing to me because that tends to be more relaxed and comfortable seating. But it does change the way you interact with the table, right? So if I'm sitting at a dining room table, I'm much more likely to get up, go to the other end, reach around, move my token as it may be. But if I'm sitting at a dining room, at, at a, uh, a um, coffee table type situation, I'm less likely to do that. Hmm. Yeah. So let, let's, let's, let me throw that question out to you guys. What, what is your optimal seating? Cause clearly Steve's taught, thought about it. I, I like the, you know, kind of couch love seat, you know, sort of, you know, comfy chair, the comfy chair. Um, that that's kind of my thing. I uh, I I actually do think about the seating. You know, if you had a, a dining room table or and usual dining room chairs, I always thought, man, that'd be all right for about half an hour to an hour, and then I'd be like, okay, I'm I'm done with this. This is not comfortable. I want to get up and sit somewhere else. I'll sit on the floor. 
uh, sit on the couch or lay on the floor or anything um, that would not be a regular like dining room chair. I, I, I have thought of that in, in terms of how is this going to be after like a three hour, four, five hour gaming session, maybe. Now that I think that works really well though if you're playing board games because generally they don't run super long. Uh, from, <laughs> well, for for majority of them, it usually have been you know half hours. Unless it's an risk, hour. yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, of course you're going to play that. You're going to access and allies monopoly. But I mean, there's quite a few of them though. They're really you know you're over within a half hour to an hour and a half maybe, and that's not horrible. And you need a nice stable surface, and usually there's enough room then for everyone to be able to get to it and see it. Now, of course, when I was a kid, we just played on the floor. <laughs> that was the way to do it because you could everyone could curl up into a ball pretty much, and nothing hurt because we were eight or a kid ten, <laughs> you know. And now that one of us <clears throat> is fifty, things hurt if you're not. Let's be you know, honest; they were hurting everyone. before fifty. A bit, yeah. But I keep I keep trying to remind you guys, you've just been catching up to me since seventh grade. <laughs> so that's, you know, I I was thinking about one thing that was very important that you mentioned, John, and that is how small Jimmy is. And <laughs> <laughs> careful, the little people have long memories. The, <laughs> and the editing button. And the editing button. <laughs> oh, yeah. True. Other small people have long memories. Right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair point. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, no, I couldn't get out of my head the fact that if we were in an adventuring party meeting somewhere, you know, you and I met and you perked up because you heard I was from far too. And then <laughs> you come waddling over to the table. Wait, wait, and, whoa, 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 whoa. What know, do you mean waddle? Well, because your legs are short too. See, I'm I'm, I'm accentuating <laughs> the small. Okay, there's only one person here who has played a halfling paladin. That is true, and it's not Jimmy. That is true. That is <laughs> true. Right. Not a waddle. You know, I totally forgot. But the uh, the halfling paladin's name was uh, Tricky Woo. <laughs> and that's the name of a dog. <laughs> From a British television series called All Creatures Great and Small, which is based on a series of books about a uh, veterinary. So I found Tricky Woo's miniature yesterday. And the coolest thing that happened before I had to stop playing him was he got a Velociraptor mount. <laughs> so, so... I had a little Velociraptor miniature that one of the other players got me, and I made a little clay saddle. And so I took Tricky Woo's little halfling character, and and he he could ride the Velociraptor. So, but uh, but yeah, okay, yeah. So yeah, let, let's get back to the to the tabletop just for a minute or two, if we may. Um, so I, I kind of think that what we've worked our way towards is sort of thinking about the the coffee table type approach to a table. And the other thing is that I think we've sort of worked our way towards the notion that sitting in a big comfy chair, which doesn't lend itself to necessarily reaching to the table you son of or interacting a, you with son the of a bitch. Much. So to, to that thought, I'm kind of curious, you know, does the technology – I didn't even get to finish the story about your little character being from, you know, the town of Short Arm. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my god. Short Arm, holy cow. (laughs) Yeah. I'm so tired. (laughs) Okay. <laughs> I'm exhausted for all the laughing. <laughs> all right. Deep breath. I'm okay. Good. I'm okay. <laughs> I'm good. I promise. I'm good. All right. So now that we've sort of worked our way towards a coffee table type approach with, with sort of comfy chairs, 
I'm wondering, let's revisit that question of technology because I know that, you know, Steve, you, you sort of came out kind of uh, against it a little bit. But it seems to me that a, a portable technology device like an iPad lends itself a little more to that type of scenario where you've got it there. But then it does sort of invite the question again, what does a gaming table bring that a normal coffee table doesn't give it? I, I don't know. I, I'm kind of, I've really gotten to the point that my attitude towards this now is I would rather have a, an iPad. <laughs> I can't look at him. I gotta hold up the screen. I can't. <laughs> so, well, I'll, I'll hold off on that. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> okay, I'm good. I'm good. I no, can't see him. I got my hands this up is, in front of the screen. I can't I, see him. I think I understand a problem <laughs> with your process. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is definitely uh, yeah. one of them. <sighs> So, so my attitude anymore has been that I really enjoy the iPad deal and then using that for my character sheet, for reference material. Um, and as long as I've got a little bit of space that I can roll my physical dice, though sometimes I've gotten to the point that I'd just rather just roll, you know, on the iPad itself. I'm okay with that a lot of times. If I can do that, I'm usually okay. And it's, I'm getting what I, like to, um, I get my, my side of it. I, th I think a lot of times it works pretty well that way. I'm comfortable. I can have a drink on the table, but I don't have to be up against the table. I don't have to be in a uncomfortable dining room chair. Now, the only issue is when we were trying to figure out our, you know, if we do use miniatures or we're trying to use maps or anything else, that becomes more of an issue because we really haven't embraced the roll 20 or whatever, you know, kind of digital realm out there for that otherwise it, it seems to do all right so what are you guys' thoughts steve and james i like hover chairs you, you like what hover chairs hover chairs hover hover like hover oh, i thought you were mispronouncing i was i was oh hovers okay. what about you steve because you again sort of sort of came out a little bit against the technology which was a little interesting so what's the main question? <laughs> so was, okay, trying not to look at Jimmy. What? <laughs> Thanks for moving your camera so I don't have to look at you because you just make me laugh. That's, uh, that's, that's, I don't, sounds derogatory. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Essentially the question was, you know, you're not a big fan of the tables with technology. So what is, what does, a gaming table bring to the that a normal coffee table doesn't adequately cover it. The word that first comes to mind is is features. I don't know utility. Utility. That's it. It's utility. It's not features. It's it's utility. It's something you know. Your coffee table is like a good starting place for a game table. If it had two drawers per side instead of just on one side. It's got this. Yeah. So, go ahead. Just to briefly describe my coffee table, because nobody else will know it, is that essentially it's got a glass. It's got two glass tops, and then it's got sort of a shelf that covers that spans the entire coffee table, and it's a fairly large coffee table. I think it's four foot wide by almost three foot deep. Uh, and then there's two drawers that you know you put your remotes and things like that underneath that sort of face the couch. So yeah, it's like a sandwich of three levels: tabletop, full length shelf. And then drawers at the bottom, plus that nice space underneath where I keep losing dust. So it's it's nice. It's also on wheels too, so you can move it around a little bit. Is it really? Oh, yeah. We don't we don't intend to, but it is actually on some oh. hard metal wheels. Oh, it's a rug, isn't it? Where's the carpet? You got a rug under the you're right rug on top of the carpet. Right, right. The under the table gaming site, there are coffee table toppers. One of them. And, and it's more for the, the small table, has all of these little things in it. It has the cup holders. It has little inserts where you can, you know, roll your dice. It's got little bitty drawers that pull out that can hold your dice and your papers and all that stuff. 
you know, having that utility while still being able to maintain it as a coffee table sur surface is, you know, that, that's what I would kind of want. I'm actually looking, I've got this, uh, I've got this mid-century coffee table. It is about three feet by three feet. It's, it's about the size of the glass insert that Jimmy and I had for, for our table. And I'm looking at it, and I'm looking at how I've got this room structured down here with five chairs and a semicircle and TV on the other side and the stereo and all that. And I'm thinking a five foot by five foot topper would fit right on that, and it would be just the right height for coffee table gaming. I'm thinking less about anything you ask me and more about what I want to build. So I'm getting kind of uh, caught up in my own head right now because I'm kind of excited about revisiting this concept. So to that end, I think that there's a lot of interesting things that we could put into a, a, a gaming table. I personally like the idea of a coffee table topper uh, just because it's something that you can take out when you want to get out and you can put away when you don't. The tricky bit here is that I want something I could turn on its side and slide behind the couch or something along those lines, as opposed to, you know, having to have a flat space that's four foot by three foot or whatever it may be uh, to set things on. I rather like the notion of having a TV in it uh, just because you could use a mapping tool of some sort using the television. You would get a natural backlight. I also rather like the idea of having an iPad wirelessly connected to it or several iPads so people can do their their movement of their tokens using the iPad, but it shows up on the main TV. I also rather like the idea of having mood lighting and something someplace that would hold cups and um to have light to have a sound that comes out of it for you know ambient sounds and that sort of thing. So that's the type of thing I would like to see in a in a tabletop thing like that. And we, as we've mentioned several times, we tend to play at my house. So I'm a little less concerned about a drawer for my stuff because I've got all the drawers in the house for my stuff if I want. But uh, that's sort of what I envision. It's somewhat along the lines of what you're talking about, Steve, just, you know, a little, a little more technology dressed up. I, I think one of the issues with, you know, kind of going the technology way, um, I don't know if, if Steve had this in mind, but I believe one of the issues you have with it is that you're not quite as engaged face-to-face -face then. If you're constantly looking at your iPad or your phone or whatever, you know, and doing everything that way, you're not actually engaged face-to-face -face quite as much. I guess Steve likes that idea as well, or agrees with that. That's a potential issue with it. Then my attitude is, you know, when we're just all sitting around relaxed, you know, on couches, et cetera, on comfy chairs. It just makes a more enjoyable, I don't know, evening, really. I mean, I can remember when we would play it, you know, when we were really young and we played at, you know, Frank would come over and spend the night. We'd play on my bed a lot of times. Or we'd be like, you know, he'd be on one, I had two beds in my bedroom. He'd be on one, I'd be on the other sometimes. And we did have a, a little uh, card table I'd put up sometimes and we'd play on it. But as we got better with it or a little bit more not quite so noobish or newbie about it and we kind of knew some of the things better we didn't need to have the books out as much and we could easily do a more relaxed setting and then when we play at his house uh, we did kind of a similar thing we could just you know maybe someone was sitting in a chair at his desk some you know other people may be sitting on his bed it just really depended on on the thing so that's what I kind of harken back to. I kind of got the point that I really liked. I mean, I love the idea of a table that has all these features. But in the grand scheme of things, I think I really prefer just, I want to be comfortable. Okay, so I actually have one last little question. One of the things we haven't talked about is sort of the new frontiers for this sort of stuff. And there's some research being done in augmented reality. So the notion is that you get these tokens and you'd put them on the table and they look like you know, quarters or whatever and they have a particular... QR code or something like that on it and you hold your phone up and then you would see this sort of animated dragon or hobgoblin or whatever it is that that token is supposed to represent. What do you guys think about that? Sort of this augmented reality or even pushing that further uh, virtual reality as a mechanism for doing some of this stuff? I'd rather use my imagination. Steve? Well, we've hit an interesting time because our 20 fantasy grounds even, even Discord these platforms are 
having, it's not exactly a renaissance, but they're having a, a surge of use right now with people who have been separated and are turning to these platforms even more than they were. Fantasy Grounds, you know, has that ability to take away, like you were talking about the Microsoft table, where it could register a, a physical dice roll and actually make adjustments to the gameplay. And Fantasy Grounds has all that built in. So when you've got it all up and running, you know, and somebody has an effect on them or there's something going on, it all kind of goes into this soup that the platform calculates the appropriate result for. So those kinds of things, those kinds of mechanics and augmentation, I think are fine and, and they're going to continue to kind of spread out for remote gaming. I think that the VR stuff is still not there. I The first time I dealt with the VR stuff was in 94, 95. And that was when they had the goggles that worked with Battletech and the game Descent. And we had that in Game Store in Tennessee. I was trying to help when it opened. And we had some network gaming set up, super high tech at the time. And people would get sick and vomit when they played Descent. And that was fun. So <laughs> always nice to have that at the front of the store. Uh, and not at the back where the bathroom is. So we moved where the games were at that point. You know, my God, that's 25 years ago. I think it's cool and I like it, but I wouldn't stake any technology. I wouldn't stake any product that I'm making right now using any technology like that that's out current. I mean, if I had a lot of money or, you know, I didn't care about money, fine. But, you know, I, I'm kind of on analog with Jimmy at the moment. Yeah, I'd probably have to say kind of, I, I kind of agree with that. I, you know, I'll actually kind of <clears throat> refer back to a previous podcast we did, but, you know, when we started off, we didn't have the money to buy miniatures. I remember when we first started gaming, that, that gaming store in Bluefield that we went to, and I remember he had the little miniatures and the little blister packs and stuff, and I remember going, oh, look, I don't need to... Four dollars, you know. I didn't. I don't have four dollars for. That's back when two months worth of groceries was four dollars. Practically, yeah. Right. Uh, mind you, this this is like eighty two went around there. So I mean, that was a pretty decent chunk of money for something that I didn't know that we would. You know, I wasn't sure if we'd use that much. I mean, it was very cool looking, but it's like, man, that that just seems like a chunk of money that I don't have to spend i mean it was already a big deal just getting like oh man it's you know i remember what it was maybe 15 dollars for the dungeon master's guide it's like holy cow so i mean you're looking at the the cost of the thing so i kind of we never really embraced the whole miniature it was all you know a theater of the mind all of it was the most the most we really had was we might pull out a sheet of paper and maybe quickly scribble, oh, okay, well, this is the hallway you're going down, and and you see the guy step out, you know, at the very end of the hallway at this T intersection, and that was that was it. You know, that might be the only thing you might, you know, help the players get an idea of what was really going on was some little bit of drawing just on a piece of paper. And I, I've been okay with what we do, you know, more recently where we just, you know, have the whiteboard that we draw, you know, quickly, we'll draw a real quick map and go, you know, sometimes we will use our miniatures on the whiteboard. So we'll draw the objects or whatever that might be in the way or that we can hide behind or, you know, saying, well, this is the roadway or whatever it might be, the hallway or whatever tree here. But that's, that actually seems to work exceptionally well for what we do. And then a lot of times it ends up being the case that Jenny's like, hey, can can you move me about three feet over? Sure. You know, and, you know, and or, or a lot of times I, I'm where I'm sitting. A lot of times I'm actually kind of far away from it. So it's a lot of times it's Steve doing that for everyone. And, and so I, I, I'm, I'm fine with that too. I don't, I really don't need the latest, greatest thing. As I said, I'm, I'm more about the comfort level of our gaming sessions. So Steve's got big old chimp arms. 
<laughs> what? <laughs> 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 so I'm going to be the the weird one here because I'm all for it. I'm I'm very excited about this notion of this augmented reality where you put a piece of like a token out and then you can hold it your phone and see an animated thing. I, I think that just would be really really cool. And um, I uh, have been a big proponent of virtual reality uh, this newest wave of virtual reality and i think that when those things get relatively small like google glass was supposed to be it's going to become a, a lot more exciting way to start interfacing with the world and i think it's going to have some interesting implications for gaming and i'm i'm just looking forward to it personally as much as i do like theater of the mind uh, i'm all for the technology in this regard and i can see it sort of eclipsing a lot of the things we're talking about with the table We appreciate you spending time with us this week. Don't forget to leave ratings and feedback wherever you listen, and check us out on RoleplayGeeks.com, Twitter at Geeks Roleplay, and on Fan... Sometimes the words don't come out right. So, blah, 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 that was supposed to be, and on Facebook and Instagram... We value our listeners' opinions. If you have suggestions, let us know. Till next week, stay safe and thanks for listening, even though I messed that up.